Spirit. This is our ninth and final lesson of our series. And so this will be the conclusion here uh, this evening. And uh, some of you are looking at this uh, handout, I know, and, and you're saying, there is no way you're going to get through all that tonight. And I'll just say this, O ye of little faith. <laughs> Uh, no, I, what we're really going to do is we're really going to buzz through this. And I'm once we get going, I'm not going to stop and say a whole lot. The scriptures are going to kind of speak for themselves. And this would really be good for you to keep because, as you see, we've, we've broken this down to, in, into a lot of different categories. Um, but in the series, we've talked a lot of, about a lot of different things. We started out in Acts, and uh, we looked at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we looked at the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the difference between those two. We talked about speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, as well as the fruit of the Spirit. We've also talked about how important it is to be full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit. Uh, we've talked about how the Holy Spirit can easily be quenched, easily be grieved. And so there's so many good things that we've talked about. If you missed a night, the notes are up here. You can always go back to YouTube and check out the videos there. A lot of good stuff, a lot of good material. Uh, but what, do we, what we want to do here tonight as we close out this series is look at the different manifestations. Everybody say manifestations. The different manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit, which is one thing. Talk about the gifts of the Spirit, which is another. But now here tonight, we want to talk about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, we know that in our Spirit-filled churches, um, we are going to see some things happen that you probably wouldn't see in non-Spirit-filled churches. Can I get an amen from anybody? And, uh, and so I thought that would be good. I really thought uh, I was just going to give a review and kind of go over the highlights of everything. But then I started praying and, and thinking about some things. I thought, you know what, this would be the perfect way to conclude this series uh, because sometimes we're not really comfortable with some things we see or, you know, we might be a little um, unaware uh, of where we find these things in Scripture. And so um, let's look, first of all, at the lifting up of holy hands. How many know when we worship the Lord, we lift up our hands? Amen? Well, why do we do that? Well, and, and this is not going to be an exhaustive list by no means, uh, but I've just went through and picked out some scriptures that kind of uh, underscore why we do these things. And so we'll start out here in Psalms chapter 63, verse number 4, where, where David says, Thus I will bless you while I live. In other words, how many know we should be blessing the Lord all the days of our life? <laughs> if we're breathing, we should be praising. Amen. Thus, I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands. There it is. I will lift up my hands in your name. Now, I've heard a couple of explanations of why we raise our hands. First of all, how many remember uh, the cops and robbers shows and the, and the cowboys and Indians? Do you remember those kind of shows? Uh, if you'll remember that, you'll recall how um, when somebody has a gun pointed at you, what do you do? <laughs> you raise your hands. And why is that? Because the raising of our hands is a sign of surrender. You know, the little white flag, I give, right? And so when we raise our hands to the Lord, not only are we worshiping Him, uh, but it's a sign of our surrender. Now, how many know the Bible says that if we don't praise Him, the rocks and the mountains are going to cry out? Amen? And so God's going to get His praise somehow. And so, and even the earth declares the glory of God. I believe when the trees are blowing and waving, I believe they're praising God. Can anybody say Amen. But look at this, uh, Psalms 134, verse number 1 and 2. It says, Behold, bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. And here it is, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Psalms 141, verse number 2. It says, Let my prayer be set before you as incense. Oh, wow. Isn't that a powerful description? 
Let my prayer be sent before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. How many have ever walked into a room and either uh, a candle was burning or incense were, was burning and you just smelt that aroma? That aroma just felt, just, just filled the room. How many know sometimes when we worship, the presence of God gets so thick you can almost smell it? <laughs> I mean, it's just like, oh, Jesus, uh, man, I tell you what, his presence gets so thick and so tan tangible sometimes. I know there was one night of the revival last week that I didn't even want to walk up here. I just felt so awe. I think that's the night we took off our shoes. I just, I just felt at all of God. And how many are thankful for his manifest presence? Oh, my goodness, it's so powerful, so real and so needful especially in the hour we live in, we're living in today. And then Psalms 143, verse number 6, um, he says, I spread out my hands to you. My soul, uh, what does it do? Longs for you like a thirsty land. Oh, my, like the deer pants after the water. So my soul longeth after thee. And boy, don't, don't you love just to worship the Lord and get caught up in that spirit of worship? Uh, we've said it so many times, worship is so powerful, it's so unique, it's so dynamic because we do it unto the Lord, but it's amazing how God takes that worship and He turns it around and He blesses us while we're blessing Him. Oh, Jesus. And so I just love uh, to worship the Lord and, and to, to, to worship and minister to Him because He always ministers to me when I, when I do that. But now let me say this, this isn't just an Old Testament practice, but look what Paul said to Timothy here in 1 Timothy. Look at this, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. He says, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, this is just what we were talking about praying, that the men would pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. How many believe you serve a God who's worthy of all your praise? Uh, can I say this? Praise and worship is, is, is something that we never do according to our feelings. You know, we, we just don't come into the house of God and, and not worship just because we're having a bad day. Guess what? God's not having a bad day. He's still worthy. He's still holy. He's still a good God. Come on, somebody. So that's why we worship him in the good times and the bad times. And let me just say this. If you want to try anything to, to bring you out of the spiritual doldrums, anybody been to the, in the spiritual doldrums before? Just begin to worship. Just begin to worship. And I promise you that spirit of whatever it is, depression, discouragement, confusion, I promise you, that thing will break, and before you know it, you'll be rejoicing in the Lord. How many would say amen? amen. And so uh, uh, another reason why we lift up our hands is this. How many remember when you were in school? Anybody remember that far back? That's a back, that's back a ways for some of us, isn't it? But remember in school how when the teacher asked a question, and if we knew what the answer was, what would we do? We'd raise our hand. How many know who the answer is tonight? Jesus. So I tell you what, we are a living testimony to the world that, hey, we know who the answer is. And his name is Jesus. Can anybody say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Woo, I'm thankful that Jesus is the answer. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And surely he's worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. And oh my goodness, we could do a whole series on just praise and worship. But how about speaking in tongues? Oh, now, this is a sign. The Bible calls this what? A sign to the unbelievers, right? Let's look quickly at this, speaking in tongues. And we've talked about it here uh, in this series, but we'll just quickly touch on it here tonight. How about Jude? Verse 20, it says this, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying how? There it is, praying in the Holy Spirit. And like we've said so many times before, uh, the two most powerful prayers that a believer can pray is praying in the Holy Ghost. And when we say Holy Ghost, that this, that's the same thing as the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Ghost and praying the Word of God back to Him. Now, listen, God is not dumb. How many would say amen? God knows what He said. 
It's not the fact that we've got to remind him, but watch this now. The Bible says that his word will not return unto him void. It will accomplish what he has sent forth, what is sent forth to do. So the thing about it is when we pray God's word back to him, that tells him that we have faith in this word. That we have faith in what he said. And so when we pray his word back to him, I tell you what, he honors his word. He watches over his word to perform it. So those are the two most powerful uh, things we can pray. How many are thankful for the Holy Ghost tonight? Amen. How many love to pray in the Holy Ghost? Just to get lost in the Spirit. And, and, and oftentimes when we begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, how many know a spirit of intercession will overtake us? And whoo, deep calls into deep. And before you know it, we're doing some amazing things in the Spirit realm. Amen. And so I'm thankful for that. How about this? Uh, look what Paul said here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 2. He said, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. Uh, however, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Think about that. Every time we pray in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is actually praying through us, and things are happening that we don't even understand. Think about that. We have the power and the ability for God to pray and to work through us simply by submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to pray through us. Then Paul goes on to say this in chapter, uh, well, same chapter, verse 15. He says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. Oh, my. How many have ever heard somebody sing in the Spirit? Isn't that the most beautiful thing you've ever heard? It's like the angels themselves singing. He says, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. And so how many know if it was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for us. Amen. It's, the, it's still that same church age that we have talked so much about. And then if we go back to the book of Acts... Uh, we see this in chapter 2. Let's look at it real quick. Chapter 2, verse number 1. And this is when the Holy Ghost was poured out. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now let me just say this. It wasn't anything they did other than waiting other than yielding. How many understand there's nothing that we can do uh, to stir this up because it's of God? Amen. It's not of us, but we just simply yield to the Holy Spirit. We get out of the way. Uh, we humble ourselves. Can I say it like this? The Holy Spirit not is not going to fill a heart that's hardened, that's rebelled, that's cold and callous. Uh, if we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we have to come to Jesus. We've got to be saved. We've got to accept Him as Lord. How many know there's a formula to this? How many understand a sinner cannot be baptized with the Holy Ghost? That's not going to happen. If they're speaking in tongues, it's not of God. Come on, somebody. We've got to yield to Jesus. There's some things, there's some order, there's some formulas, and we've talked about that uh, in this series. And so uh, we've just got to yield. We've got to give way to the Holy Spirit. And so suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled. Everybody say all filled. Not just the disciples, but they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then uh, if, we, if you would continue on in chapter 2, we know that uh, they came out and, you know, wow, folks thought, man, these are drunk. And uh, Peter's like, well, listen, it's just 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk, but it is new wine. <laughs> this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. Amen. So, again, I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. And uh, if we keep moving on here, because i gotta, I got to keep moving at a, at a good clip here. Number three is falling under the power, or in other words, slain in the spirit. Um, now, obviously, we, we see this. 
uh, in our services. And I've got several scriptures here for you. Let's start out with John. John chapter 18, verse number 6. And let's look at some references in, in the Bible where, where people fell out. Now, when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and they did what? Fell to the ground. Now, let me say this. Uh, we know that this instant right here, this example, it wasn't a courtesy fall from fellow believers, right? Hello? You know what I'm talking about? Well, you know, everybody else is falling out, so I'm just going to fall out. No, these are unbelievers. Everybody say unbelievers. unbelievers. These are the soldiers that have come to get Jesus. These are the religious people who are, who are in denial of who Jesus really is. And when Jesus makes this statement, I am he, guess what? Poof. Unbelievers. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm coming to get Jesus and he makes such a powerful statement and it knocks me over, I'm probably going to go, okay, I'm going home. I mean, I'm just saying. Just saying. But, so obviously that was no courtesy fall from believers. This was unbelievers who were slain. Uh, and then another example of an unbeliever falling in God's presence is found here in Acts chapter 9, verse number 4. Let's look at it. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, how many understand at this point in time, Saul was an unbeliever? He didn't believe in Jesus, right? <laughs> in fact, he was persecuting the Christians. So here's, a, here's another example of an unbeliever falling out under the power of God. I like to say it like this. Um, when we as human beings come into contact with the supernatural God of the universe, I'm going to know there's going to be some kind of manifestation. I mean, you just can't come into contact. You just can't come into his presence and not be affected. <laughs> remember when, uh, remember when uh, Moses wanted to see his glory, wanted to see him? And uh, he, Jesus was like, no, listen, Moses, you, it'll kill you. But it, what he did was he, he just hid him in the cleft of the rock, and he just passed by, and he got to see his hinder parts a little bit. How many understand that us right now in our physical mortal bodies, we cannot contain the full measure of the glory of God? But when we come into a little bit of a contact with it. Anybody been electrocuted before? Yeah, the electrician has. Boy, don't have him work on anything. <laughs> yeah, there, why? Because there's power there. It zaps you. Guess what? When we get in connection with the living God, there's power there. Oh, somebody needs to shout right now. Come on, somebody. <laughs> there's power. And so how many thankful that, that Saul came into contact with that power and it totally transformed his life, didn't it? So there, there's always going to be some kind of manifestation. Let's, let's look at this, Second Chronicles chapter 5. And I want to read this out of the King James. Second Chronicles chapter 5, look at this. And it came to pass that when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, Asaph, of Haman, of Judathan, with their sons and with their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and palstries and harps, and stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. My goodness, could you imagine what that sounded like? Wow! It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud. Come on, somebody. Even the house of the Lord. Now think about this. This is Old Testament. This is, for the, this is before the Holy Spirit was poured out. The cloud was so thick, the presence of God was so thick that the priests could not what? They could not stand 
They could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. My, 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 my. Wouldn't you like to have been in that service? How many know we can be? (laughs) We can be. If we just get out of the way and let God have His way. Amen. Even so much more. After the cross, after the day of Pentecost, how many know that, really, truthfully, how many know that should be a normal thing? It really should. It should be a normal thing in our services. Look at this, Matthew chapter 28, verse number 4. And the guards shook for fear of him, and they became like what? Dead men. Wow. (laughs) How about John the Revelator? Remember him? On the Isle of Patmos? Received the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 17, it says this, And when I saw him, how many see that the H is capitalized? (laughs) And when I saw him, who did he see? The lamb who was slain. Jesus sitting on the throne. Amen. Hallelujah. And when I saw him, I did what? Fell at his feet as dead. Wow. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. Woo-hoo! Can I, my goodness, can anybody say praise the Lord? Wow, I tell you, I about felt that one right there. Mm. So when we come into contact with God, there's going to be some kind of manifestation. I mean, if it's really Him, there's going to be some kind of manifestation, Amen. We're going to laugh, we're going to cry, we're going to weep, we're going to fall, we're going to do something. Speaking of, how about number four? Holy laughter. Anybody ever hear anybody laugh in the Holy Ghost? Oh my goodness, it's like singing. What a beautiful, beautiful sound and sight it is. Psalm 1611, look at it here. It says, you will show me the path of life, for in your presence, his presence, is what? Fullness. Of joy. How many want your joy to be full? Well, we got to get in his presence then. For in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. How many know there's there's a lot of people spending a lot of money trying to find joy in the world we live in? Trying to find peace, contentment. We want to be entertained. How many know we want to laugh? We spend money trying to laugh. Watching shows on television, going to some kind of comedy show or something. But can I tell you, if we just get in the presence of Jesus, our joy is going to be full. Can anybody say amen? Uh, Now, I will say this about holy laughter. How many know it's contagious? Oh, it's contagious. I remember one service that we had over at West. Oh, my goodness. It just started out here with a couple. And before you know it, it was just spreading. Oh, hallelujah. The joy of the Lord. Amen. Psalms 126, 2, it says this. Then our mouth was filled with what? Filled with laughter. (laughs) And our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. How many know uh, one of the things the devil wants? He wants wants to come, steal, kill, and destroy everything that we have. But there's a couple of things that he always starts with. You ever notice he starts with our peace? Starts with our joy. I wonder why that is. Because he knows that's really important to our spiritual well-being, isn't it? Our peace of mind. Our joy. And why would our joy be important? We're going to get to that here in a minute. Hang on. And so uh, Psalms 132.16 says, says, I will also clothe her priest with salvation, and her saints shall what? Woo! Shout aloud for joy. Oh, how many know the devil wants to keep us shut up, doesn't want us to speak, doesn't want us to say anything, doesn't want us to shout, amen, but how many know the devil is not only defeated, he's a liar, come on somebody, amen. Look at this, Romans chapter 14, verse 17, and like we said, you know, it's not just Old Testament, it's New Testament, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace, that's what we were just talking about, and what? Joy in the Holy Spirit. 
How many know the child of God should have joy? Now, I'm not saying that we got to go around telling jokes and make everybody laugh everywhere we go. But there should be a peace within us. There should be a joy, amen, that not only suffices us and encourages us on a daily basis, but like we said, it's contagious. People just see that. It, 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 it just kind of permeates off of us. We've talked about this before, how a child of God should have a certain, how do I say this? Uh, not a personality, but how many know when a child of God comes into a room, we really should shift the atmosphere. We should bring the peace. We should bring the joy. We should bring all these things with us because if he is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Let me ask you this. Where's the kingdom of God? It's within us. Well, you know what? All these things need to manifest out of us, right? And joy is one of them. How many are thankful you have the joy of the Lord tonight? And so the kingdom of God is not eating, drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 1.8. Look at this. Whom having not seen you love, though now, now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy, unspeakable, inexpressible. In other words, this joy is so good, it's so big, I can't explain it. I know that's pretty good joy right there. And not only is it unexpressible, but it's full of glory. And how many know the half has never yet been told? How many want to hear the other half? Ah, thank you, Lord. How about this, Proverbs 17, 22. We're still talking about holy laughter here, the joy of the Lord. A merry heart does good like a what? Medicine. A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Now, let me say this, because I think this is important. I entitled this Holy Laughter, but how many know it's more than laughter? How many know the world laughs? A lot of people laugh, but they don't have joy, right? How many know you can laugh, but not have joy? But we're talking about something that's deeper than just a laugh. But we're talking about something that's supernatural that is, is down on the inside of our spirit, man. i, I got to read this again. A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit does what? Dries the bones. Oh, my goodness. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 10. Here it is. This is what we were talking about earlier. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portion to those who... For whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to the Lord. Do not sorrow. Everybody say, do not sorrow. Do not sorrow. Well, well, how is that possible that we don't sorrow? For the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, how do all these things come about? How does peace come? How does joy come? It's got to come through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. He's the encourager. He's the teacher. He's the paraclete. He's so many things. What did Jesus say? He said, listen, guys, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you the comforter. In other words, I'm with you now, but there's coming a day that I'm going to be... I'm going to be in you. Now, what's greater, for us to see Jesus and be with him or for to have him living on the inside? We've already said it. He is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And how many know hope is one of those things we need to be in possession of? Hope. Everybody say hope. How many know the devil doesn't want you to have any hope? Why is that? Because if we don't have any hope, we're going to give up. We're not going to pray. We're not going to come to church. We're not going to be doing what we should, should be doing because we're, seeming, we're leaving in the, living in this seemingly hopeless situation. So we're thinking, what's the use? I'm just going to sit here on the couch, watch TV till I die. I mean, no, the devil is a liar. So hope is one of those things that we have. How many are thankful for the blessed hope tonight? And when the world talks about hope, it's not a very strong or an assuring word. But when the Bible talks about hope, it's a done deal. How many would say amen? <laughs> I'm glad we have this hope. Amen. Now, now watch this. And guys, go ahead and throw this up on the screen. Watch this. Where there's no joy, 
there's no strength. But if we know joy, we know strength. How many know joy? Have everybody, has everybody ever been in, introduced to joy? <laughs> All right, joy. Uh, how many understand that strength is necessary for survival? In our physical bodies, we have to have strength. How do we sustain our strength? We just don't work out. We think of strength. We think, oh, I got to work out. I got to work out. Listen, if we just worked out all the time and didn't eat, how many know we'd frizzle out pretty soon? So if we want strength, we've got to take in calories, nourishment. How many know we've got to do that spiritually? We've got to feed our spirit man. You say, well, what do we feed our spirit man? The word. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Everybody grab your Bible and say, this is not only my sword, this is my breakfast in the morning. (laughs) This is my lunch at noontime. Come on, somebody. This is my supper. Right? It nourishes us. It feeds us. Amen. Your snack. Come on, Sister Linda. Snacking on the word of God. I love it. Woo, hallelujah. How many of we ain't ever going to get fat on the word either? So no joy, no strength. But when we know joy, then we know strength. Amen. Okay, how about dancing before the Lord? Oh, my goodness. Here we go. All right. Getting into the good stuff here. Let's go to 2 Samuel. Anybody ever dance before the Lord? I got a story to tell you here in a minute. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Verse number 14. We'll begin reading. Then David danced before the Lord. Barely did he dance. He just, his hand danced before the Lord. (laughs) No, David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. And so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, which is David's wife, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she what? Despised Despised him in her heart. How many know there's always going to be haters out there? Always going to be haters. So they brought the ark of the Lord and sat it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle, that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread and a piece of meat and a cake of raisins, so that all the people departed Everyone to his house. How many know the church has been eating for a mighty long time? (laughs) Coming together in fellowship and amen. Then David, watch this now. Then David returned to bless his household. But how many know some people just don't want to be blessed? How many know you can't pastor people who refuse to be pastored? You can't lead people who refuse to be led. Watch this. David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, It was before the Lord. In other words, I did it unto God, who chose me, Instead of your father, ooh, Jesus, come on, somebody say, go David, and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. Remember Brother Morgan's song, I'm going to get worse? (laughs) That's what it was from. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Now, what Michael is complaining about here 
is when they got the Ark of the Covenant back, David, who is the king, how many know David's the king? He's the man. Well, guess what kings wear? Kings wear robes. But, but David stops and he says, you know what? I'm not the real king here. Somebody help me with my robe. So David takes off his kingly robe, and he has maybe a T-shirt and shorts on, or I don't know what he had. I don't know what they wore underneath their robes back then. And he dances before the Lord with all his might. But how many know some people are never appreciative of true praise and true worship? Because David's expression of worship exposed where Michael's heart was at. Huh. Boy, isn't he something? Look what he's doing. Oh, my goodness. Watch this. It only gets worse. Verse 23. Before Michael, the daughter of Saul, therefore, I'm sorry, therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. In other words, not only was she spiritually barren, but now God has struck her physically barren. No kids. No kids. No blessings to you. David's youngins are going to come through somebody else. How many know God ain't playing with this? Listen, church, you can have an attitude with me. You can have an attitude with the worship leader, but let me tell you, you come in here in the house of God, you better be praising and you better be worshiping. Because when you don't, you're not disrespecting me. You're not disrespecting FGEC. In fact, listen, if I'm in such an attitude that I'm going to come to church and not worship, you know what? I'm just not going to come to church at all. Because I tell you what, if I come to church and just look like an old bump on a log and not going to worship and not be doing it. Man, I tell you what, I fear God. You know what? I'm saying. And, and, and I tell you what, I just, man, I don't know. I know we're in the age of grace, but how many, how many don't want to push it? And so Michael was barren from there on out. Woo, how many believe God's worthy of the dance tonight? He's worthy of the dance, brother. I'm telling you. Now, uh, let's keep going here. Psalms 149. Oh, no, wait a minute. Yeah, no, no, I, I read all that. Psalms 149.3. Let them praise his name with the dance. There it is. Let them sing praises to him with the tremble and heart. 150 verse 4. Praise him how? Praise him with the tremble and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments. And flutes. Listen. We think that instruments are, are, are some folks. I, I, guess it's, I guess it's broke through the culture now. Because um, back in the day, how many know it was only the Pentecostal churches that had organs and pianos and drums? And I guess you're seeing that more and more now even in the, in the mainline denominations. But some folks think, oh, no, only the world gets to play with music. Listen, what was Lucifer in heaven? He was the worship leader. Guess what he did? When, when, when God kicked Lucifer out of heaven, he took all that stuff with him. And he perverted the song, the dance, the music. And now finally the church is just getting wind that, hey, that was ours to begin with. That's why we use all these instruments. That's why we dance before the Lord with all our might. Come on, somebody. My goodness, I feel like preaching on a Wednesday night. Ooh, my. <laughs> Let me say it like this. Before you got saved, did anybody ever go to the club? Us white folks call it the honky-tonk. Did anybody ever go out dancing? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, listen. Just because you got saved doesn't mean you stop dancing. You just switch partners. You just switch partners. Amen. Dancing for the Lord. Oh, Jesus. Look at this. Exodus chapter 15, verse number 20. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, 
took the tremble or the tambourine in her hand, and all the women, wouldn't you love to have seen this? What a sight it would have been. All the women went out after her with trembles and with dances. Anybody remember when this was? Somebody tell me, when did this happen? When they, when they crossed the, the Red Sea? They, that's it. They're out there. Woohoo! Let's worship God. Let's have a praise break. Come on. Has God done anything for you lately? Have we praised Him for it? Have we got out the tambourine and praised Him for it? <laughs> Ooh. Oh, the devil hates it when we praise God. There's victory in our praise. There's victory in our worship. How about running before the Lord? You ever seen anybody run before the Lord? Look at this, 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 46. Anybody getting anything out of this? Good, because I had to do a lot of homework. Get all this together. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 46. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. Remember this story? And he girded up his loins. In other words, he got ready. I'm going to run. <laughs> and he girded up his loins, and he did what? And ran ahead of Ahab, who's on a chariot. He ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Ooh, how many know that was a Holy Ghost run right there? I don't know how fast he went, but he, he was moving along. How about this? Psalms 1829. For by you I can run against or through a troop. And by my God I can leap over a wall. Woo, Jesus. Does anybody remember the lame man who from his mother's womb <laughs> laid at the gate called Beautiful? Look at it here, Acts chapter 3, verse 8. So he leaping up stood and walked and entered into the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. You say, Steve, what was the big deal about that? The big deal about that is he had never walked before. How many know when we're children, little, little toddlers, mom and dad have to teach us how to walk? How many know not only did the Holy Ghost heal him, boom, right there, but he, the Holy Ghost taught him how to walk? Look at that. Man, I love that. So he leaping up stood and walked and entered in the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Ooh, how many know that's just like our God? That's a miracle. How many love to see miracles? Oh, my goodness. How about some other manifestations? Let's go back to Joel. And this is in reference to the latter rain or the former rain that would be poured out on the day of Pentecost. Joel chapter 2. And this is what um, Peter is quoting when he, when he talked about, he said that this is that. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. Here it is, the process, the formula, God's timing. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall what? Prophesy. Your old men shall do what? Dream dreams. We're going to talk about dreams here in a minute. Your young men shall see visions, and also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Woo! Now, let's fast forward to the fulfillment of of this prophecy, Acts chapter 2, verse number 15. We've already alluded to it. Peter, who, by the way, how many remember Peter before Pentecost? The coward Peter. He denies that he knows, knows Christ. He goes and hides. But how many know the Holy Ghost to put a little spunk in you? The Holy Ghost will put a little boldness in you, won't it? He said, let's back up to verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, 
see it as only the third hour of the day, or in other words, it's 9 a.m., 9 o'clock in the morning. But this is what? This is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass that in the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. That's a sign. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. That's a sign. Your young men shall see visions. That's a sign. Your old men shall dream dreams. That's a sign. And upon my men servants and upon my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Oh, my goodness. Manifestations. Everybody say manifestations. So sometimes we see things happen, and they don't necessarily fall under the gifts. They don't necessarily fall under the fruit. And so we, we label them as manifestations. And then how about this, number eight? Let, 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 me, go back and, let me go back and tell this little story here. we got time. Talking about running, dancing before the Lord. I can remember many years ago, um, oh my goodness, we had, we've had so many powerful moves of the Holy Spirit. And I can remember being, I don't even know how young I would have been, at what time it would have been, but I can remember the Holy Ghost moving and uh, I would say, God, I want to run. I want to run. See other people run and get blessed. and whew, Man, I want that. I want that. Anybody been like that? And uh, I don't know how many times I prayed that. I don't know how many times I saw my time come and go. And then one service, I can remember it. The Holy Ghost was moving. Things were happening. And I said, God, I want to run. And guess what I heard? Run. And so when, that, when I heard that, that's not what I expected. Because I guess I expected God to pick me up by the nap of my neck and run me around the church, but it didn't, it didn't happen that way. I just heard, not an audible voice, but in my spirit, man, anybody know what I'm talking about? Real loud and clear in my spirit, man, I heard, go, run. So guess what? I took off, and I remember, I went that way. I made it about three-quarters of the way down that aisle, and I fell on my face and began to speak with tongues, and I was there for I don't know how long. Why? Because I yielded, I wanted it, I desired it. How many know the Holy Ghost is never going to make you do anything? If we sit back and say, oh, I don't believe in this, uh, you know, it's a joke, and we have that condescending attitude, guess what? It's not going to happen to us. But if we'll say, God, listen, I don't understand this, but if it's really you, I want it. How many know that has happened to so many people? Listen, I have heard that testimony up teen times down through the years where people have said, God, if this is really you, I want it. And you know, at some point in time, they're filled. They're filled. I've heard of people being filled driving down the road. Now, I wouldn't recommend that, but it's happened, hasn't it? It's happened. <laughs> so I just had to, I had to share that story. And then how about uh, number eight, unable to move. Now, doesn't that sound strange? Unable to move. Look at this in Acts. Um, Acts, chap Acts chapter 10, verse number 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a what? Trance. Huh. And then, and then Peter again in chapter 11, verse number 5. It says, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. Hmm. And then it happens to Paul. That was Peter, but now look, it happens to Paul. Chapter 22, verse number 17. Now it happened. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, that I was in a trance. You say, well, why, do, why would God ever put us in a trance? Well, I don't know about then, but I know what our world is like right now. 
And how many know it's really hard to just shut everything off and concentrate on Him? So what better way for us to get lost into the Spirit where God literally puts us in a trance and we're unable to move? Now, I I gave a testimony a while ago. Let me say this. There's only one time in my life when I really felt like I was in a trance. Uh, We were having revival with, uh, uh, who's the young guy from Missouri? Oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. Daniel Tidmore. Anybody remember Daniel Tidmore? The young man from Missouri. You know what? I think we've got this on video. Is this when all heaven broke loose? It is, isn't it? It's the night that all heaven broke loose on Monroe Street. And you name it, we saw it that night. But uh, Brother Daniel Tidmore is leading this service, and I'm over here on this side of the platform and I just slump over and I stay like that for it's a long time isn't it we've got this on video and it's funny because we watched this a few months ago I don't even know why we we got it out and watched it Uh, I didn't even realize that I had done that and I, I try to go back and remember what that was like and I don't even remember that and so that's the, only, that's the only time I think I've only been close to, ha- to being in a trance, and I really don't know what, God all, what all God did that night, but it was, I know it was God. How many know when it is God and when it isn't God? Just because we, we can't explain it doesn't mean it's not God. In fact, let me say it like this. If we can explain it, it's probably not God. So how about this, number nine, unable to speak. Look at this, Luke chapter 1, verse 20. But behold, you will be what? Mute. Unable to say anything. You will be mute and not able to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Wow. Kind of like the saying, what's that saying? If you can't say nothing nice, (laughs) don't say anything at all. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Lord, sanctify our mouths. Amen. Amen. Sanctify our tongues. How about this, number 10? Shaking and trembling. How many ever has ever seen somebody shake under the power of God? Oh, my goodness. How many of that's why they called the Quakers Quakers? Because they quaked under the power of God. That's why they called them Quakers. Acts chapter 9, verse number 6. So he, and this, this is Saul here, So he saw trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, you have my attention. (laughs) I'm trembling under your power. What do you want me to do? How many know God has a way of getting our attention? Mm. How about crying and weeping, number 11? Crying and leaping. Yeah, you you ever been there? I think we've all been there. Luke chapter 7. Verse number 36, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat, he here being Jesus. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of fragrant oil, boy, we know this story, don't we? And stood at his feet behind him, what? Weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. My goodness. My goodness. You know what? Let's, let's keep reading. Just to, This is such a powerful story. Now, when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, how many know there's always some religious folk watching us? He spoke to himself saying, this man, meaning Jesus, if he were really a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Wow. Wow. Let's jump down to verse 44 for the sake of time. Verse 44. 
Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. How many know that was a big deal back then? Because all they wore was sandals, and your feet got really dirty walking everywhere. You gave me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are what? You don't think your worship isn't powerful? Look what her worship just did for her. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, and she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Wow. Wow. All right. Let's, let's conclude with dreams and visions. How many dreamers do we have here tonight? Okay, well, I'm starting to have more dreams. Starting to have more dreams than... I've had before. I've been praying and asking the Lord, give me dreams, give me dreams, give me. And not just dreams, but spiritual dreams that, that mean something. And so I've been having a few. I know Pastor Tom has had a couple. And so I would encourage you this. If, if you want some dreams, pray, ask the Lord, um, you know, to cover your mind, to give you those dreams, and then write them down. Because how many know we have a tendency to forget what we dreamt about? So I would encourage you to write them down once you dream that. And sometimes, you know, even if you've dreamt it and you woke up, you know, get up in the middle of the night and write it down because the devil will take it from us. Look at this in Numbers chapter 24, verse number 4. The utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty. Ah, vision. Who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. Now, let me say this before we go any farther, and I'm almost done. Dreams, visions, prophecies, words spoken over us, whatever, those things are to never take place of the Word of God. The Word of God must be number one. It must be the precedent in, in our lives. Uh, the Word of God and praying. That's how we're led by the Spirit. But I will say this. Oftentimes, God will confirm His will to us by these things, by a dream, by a vision, by words of prophecy, uh, like Pastor Victoria shared Sunday, you know, the man at the gas station? Texas. <laughs> how many know that proved to be God? And so... It, it, God will give us those confirmations, but they are never to take place of our prayer life and our study and reading of the Word. How many would say amen? They are to only complement, to enhance, and that is so important, so important. Everybody say so important. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. Let me do a Brother John thing right here. Come on, wave at me. I understand that, but listen, there's so many folks today especially this younger generation that are just relying on the dreams, the visions, the word of prophecies that people are given in them instead of, yeah, exactly. Because how many times have we talked about it, there's great deception coming. And how does the devil come? As an angel of light. Yes. As a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? So that's why we, we've got to be so careful. Matthew one twenty. look at this. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take, your, uh, take you marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So there's a dream there. How about Acts chapter 9, verse 10? Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, there it is, vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And finally, we see another example of a vision here in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse number 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. So then, with what I just said in mind, let me say this. Another reason why God would speak to us in dreams, 
visions, something supernatural, is because we aren't reading the Word of God. Everybody get it? We're not reading the Word of God. We're not in prayer, so God has to say, hey, listen. Remember we talked about it Sunday, how, how God had to get Moses' attention? Yes. 